Hi everyone, my name is Andra Stanoyu and you're listening to the Healthy Debate Show here on UK Health Radio, the real feel-good radio and podcast. About 270 million people between 15 and 64 had used psychoactive drugs in previous year and about 35 million people are estimated to be affected by drugs use disorders. Every year worldwide, alcohol is the cause of 5.3% of deaths. How can we improve the current statistics and support ourselves throughout the recovery process? We will talk about the challenges of addiction and the intention to start and follow a recovery plan with Mike Murphy, a best-selling author and course creator who dedicated his life to helping people achieve their dreams and manifest their deepest desires. Hi, Mike. Welcome to the Healthy Debate Show. Hello, Andre. Great to be here. Thank you very much for accepting my invitation. I know you have um, achieved great, uh, you have completed great work with your customers, and I'm really interested in finding out more about, uh, you know, what's behind your intention of working with intention, um, and of course about uh, your foundation and general what drives you um, supporting others and and uh, trying to to help people manifest their deepest desires. Perfect. So please tell us a few things about your background, you know, what's, what's behind the intention of writing books, informing people, supporting people. Yeah, so thank you for that question. So I've had two unique experiences in my life. And, and the reason I write books is because I have an eighth grade education. I left school in eighth grade. I became a habitual runaway juvenile delinquent. And I was a complete mess up until about 28 years old. And I had the good fortune in 1982, I was in a 12-step program. I had um, no education, I was $40,000 in debt, I had no net worth, I had no credit but bad credit, I had no future, no hope. And I'm in this 12-step program and the buddy says, hey man, you're, you're a complete mess, but I know somebody that might be able to help you. So he introduced me to this man. And the first day I went to the man's house, he said, Mike, you come here one hour a week for seven weeks and I promise you you will get everything you want in life and by the way it's fifty dollars an hour and this is 1982 and I don't have 50 cents so anyways I I write a bad check for the first session and then eventually he got paid but um, the basically the premise was this I didn't know it at the time I didn't know anything at the time I was just a a guy with no hope and and this guy offered me a a life preserver. And he's, and so the first thing he said, listen, you got to create a balanced life. So he said, we're going to pick, put your life in the six categories. So like for career, relationships, financial contribution, personal development, those kind of things. Right. And then he said, the powerful thing we're going to do is we're going to pick an area of what you want most in each area. And then we're going to write an intention as if it already exists because there's no difference between imagination and reality. Of course, none of this made sense to me at the time, but once again, I just sat down and did what he said. He said, number one, what do you want most? Well, two years prior to this, I had walked out on my wife and my two-month-old baby daughter because I'm a habitual runaway. The only difference was my parents always took me back. She didn't. So there I find myself two years later, divorced, miserable, totally depressed, uh, just can't stay off drugs, can't stay off alcohol. He says, okay, and I said, what I want most is to reconcile with my wife, who is, is I'm divorced, my ex-wife, who hates my guts, and my two-year-old baby girl. He said, okay, let's write it. So imagine this. I'm writing this intention, and it goes something like this. Lisa and I are so happily married. Our daughter, Michelle, thrives in this marriage. And while I'm writing this, I go, well, my man, I mean, it was very confusing as I'm writing this, but for a brief second, it felt good, and I had a little hope. So next week, what do you want, Mike? I want to own my own business. What do you want next week, Mike? I want to make $10,000 a month. I never made more than two. What do you want next, Mike? I want to own my own house. What do you want next? I want to run a marathon. He said, week six is mine. It has to be a contribution goal because you have to give back. I said, okay, well, my dad had a rough childhood. I had a rough childhood. I'd like to create a, a, a boy's home for troubled youth. So the magic happens in week seven. Now imagine this is 1982. I don't know anything about any of this. He brings out a boom box. <laughs> and for you young people, that's what we used to listen to music on. And he puts in <laughs> he puts in a cassette tape with theta brainwave frequency music. 
Then he hands me a microphone attached to a tape recorder and he puts in a blank cassette tape. And then he hands me a relaxation script about two pages long. He says, here's what I want you to do now. Read the relaxation script and then read your intentions one by one. And I do. So there I am seven weeks later, I leave there $350 poorer with a cassette tape with a relaxation script and seven, six intentions recorded on it. And he says, Mike, here's the most important thing. You need to listen every morning right when you awake because your, your brain waves are in theta, which is the best time to pierce the conscious mind, get into the subconscious mind. Once again, he's speaking French to me, but I'm going to follow the simple directions. And he says, listen, last thing right before you fall asleep. Well, lo and behold, Four months later, I own my own business. Two years later, um, my ex-wife calls me up and says, hey, I, I need an escort to a Christmas party. We get remarried, have three more kids. Um, I start making a bloody fortune and financially. We own our own house. I mean, everything works, right? And so I just become a very uh, successful, wealthy father of four. I'm teaching um, Little League Baseball. I'm teaching Bible studies at church. I'm just your regular guy. And then everything gets turned upside down. So... If you want me to tell you that story, I'm happy to tell you that one because that's the other critical thing that happened to me. Let's pause for a second because I'm just curious to to hear more about this specific uh, fragment of your life, and then of course we'll go back to uh, to sure. the second episode. So I am I do believe in intention, but it must have been something else, Mike, that really made it work for you. Yeah. So I'm, what do you think it was maybe the other ingredient? Because you have the intention, you believe the intention will work. What else did you add to this package to make it work? Because it sounds amazing, and I'm sure it wasn't that simple. So here's what I've come to believe and learn since. And I've, you know, obviously I've been studying this subject for 40 years. I've been teaching it to my employees for 20 years. And now once I became an author, I'm teaching it to more people in the public. So what I really believe is that one – An intention, a thought, is energy vibrating in a secret at a certain frequency. That's what Tesla taught us if we want to understand the universe. Now, when I attach powerful emotion to that intention, for in this case, you know, it was a, a love intention to, I want to be a good father again. I want to be a good husband again. So there was a lot of emotion attached to that. And the same with owning my own business. I mean, there was a lot of gratitude for this opportunity. And it's that I really believe it's in feeling the feeling, the 50 trillion cells in my body, feeling this intention as if it's real. If so, I really believe that that that's when I'm listening every morning, every night, two things are happening. One, I put myself in a self-hypnotic trance. So I've limited the conscious mind. So now those intentions can get through the conscious mind into the subconscious mind, which I believe is the supercomputer. Once we learn how to access it, once we learn how to get rid of limiting beliefs and install powerful beliefs, then the subconscious is a supercomputer. And at the same time, I really believe that 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 the sound, that energy, the vibration frequency of those intentions with those powerful emotions, intentions attached to them go into the field of influence infinite possibility where they meet like-minded thoughts, like-minded energies of emotions, and and then eventually they come together in the physical reality. See, because I believe I look at my life and I look at everything in my physical reality, I go, well, what what is here that didn't start first as a thought and a desire? And everything in my life starts with a thought and a desire. So I really believe that's what the law of attraction is, and that's what I really believe that I use to manifest. For, I, I had no business creating a beautiful life and i think it was this technology and this this way of thinking and living that enabled me to create great wealth health success and all that stuff so what made you believe that this person with this method can help you and i'm going to ask and i'm and i'm intentionally asking you this because equally you work you know with people who might not believe in in this yes. right from the beginning yeah so what made it work for you what made you Actually sit down and listen to this guy and follow through. Well, the reason I went, I mean, I had no hope. I mean, he was my, he was, he was my last hope for the creative life. But once, once he taught me this, I wanted to learn more, right? Even before. Mm -hmm. So I started reading books. I started going to seminars and I'll never forget this one book that I, I read. It's called The Power of Your Subconscious Mind. And it was written by a guy named Joseph Murphy. Uh, no relation that I'm aware of. <laughs> 
And it was written in the 20s or 30s. And that, I mean, that just blew my mind because he really talks about the superpower of the subconscious mind. You know, right now, your subconscious, my subconscious, everybody listening here, our subconscious mind is taking over in over a million bits of data every second. And then it delivers 40 bits of data to our conscious mind because that's all the conscious mind can handle. So what does the subconscious choose? Because it doesn't judge. So it chooses what it thinks we want. And what? how does it determine that? What we say, what we think, what we feel. So if I walk around all day like, you know, nothing ever goes right for me. Man, I have the worst luck. I just can't get my act together. Well, that supercomputer of the subconscious mind is now looking for 40 bits of data to deliver to my conscious mind to help me to confirm what it thinks I want because it doesn't judge. And so, and this is how everything works in the world. Once we understand it, now we can use the power of our voice, our words, our emotions to manifest what it is that we truly want. And here's the other thing that's really important, Andra, is we're programmed from birth to age eight. Why? Because we're, we're in theta brainwave state. We're a sponge. So everything we see and feel and hear from our parents, that becomes our programming, TV, school. And now we have iPads and all this other stuff. So most of us are programmed to believe stuff that we've never questioned. We just because it's what's programmed It's part of our programming. So I really believe we have a lot of limiting beliefs in our programs because very few of us are born to two <laughs> really strong, normal parents. Right. So we have a lot of unraveling to do. Then we need to install our own software into them, into the mind. And now we can manifest what we truly want from our heart. I'm really pleased you brought this up because uh, the personal development element of it, because what I don't want is our listeners to think that you, you just need to think about yeah. the yeah. intention and that's it. You know, there, there is work to be done yes. uh, and it's, it's, it's intense work and it does need to be, you know, the intention does need to be top up with, you know, personal development with yep. with the belief that the change can happen so that's that's great to hear mike tell me a bit about the second uh, event in your life that made you follow the path of intentions and, and i will and i just want to add one thing to what you just said because it's so powerful and i want people to get this there's a great book that i'm sure you've heard of maybe read called think and grow rich it's sold millions and millions of copies i love the book but i hate the title because we just can't think and grow rich, okay? What, what I learned is that when I have an intention and I put it out there, now the plan will come to me. I'll download the plan from wherever. The right person will show up, the right funding, the right book, the right idea. That's the most important thing. But, but you have to get off your butt and you gotta go out and execute your plan. So so there is, a, you have to take massive action as well. So I just wanted to add that. So thank you for bringing no, that. No, that. but that's very important. That's very yeah. important, yeah. So here's the other thing that happens. So like I said, I have a perfect life. <laughs> I mean, really do. I'm the last person on planet Earth to ever get divorced. I promise you. I see friends getting divorced. I go, well, how stupid can they be? I was divorced for five years. I've never been in so much pain and suffering, right? And so here I am. I own this Chevrolet dealership. And this woman walks in to sell me uh, television advertising on Telemundo Hispanic Station. The moment I, our eyes meet, there's an, this amazing connection. She'd been married two months the day she walked in there. Like I said, I'm the last guy to ever get divorced. We worked together for seven months. Our connection was so powerful, so overwhelming that she's falling in love with me. I don't know it. I'm falling in love with her. She doesn't know it. One day we compare notes and we start an affair. And because we're very proper people and we don't want to hurt anybody, we immediately separated from our spouses. And the only regret I have in my life is that I lied to my wife and four kids I, I went and said, I, I just need some space. I'm going to separate, which was a lie. I was in love with someone else, and that's why I left. If I would have said that, I would have eliminated a lot of problems. So fast forward. So imagine this. We both lie. Four months into this, we're living together. Four months into this, her husband finds out all heck breaks loose. Four months after that, my wife finds out all heck breaks loose. And a month after that, I find a stage three golf ball sized tumor in her breast, and she's only 29 years old. So here I am caught between, you know, a real mess. And my doctor told me, you know, this woman's probably not going to live very long. So nevertheless, I, we both ended up getting divorced. We get married in 2006. 2007, she's desperate to have a child. But, of course, the chemotherapy has really cooked her. So we're going to do in vitro fertilization. The guy who says, hey, man, you got to go get a check with your oncologist because we're going to pump you with hormones. He finds a tumor at stage four. Now we got to fight this battle. And so 
So we're fighting it. On December 10th, 2010, the oncologist says, Margo, unfortunately, the cancer spreads to the lining of your brain. If you do nothing, you have six weeks to live. If you treat it, you have six months to live. So we just, you know, we never even talked about it. We're going to fight like heck to beat it. And then every night we prepare for her to take that last breath. So she dies. I'm totally devastated. You know, Plato taught that we're one soul cut in half. And we spend many lifetimes looking for the other half, and that's called a twin flame. And I really believe that Margo and I were twin flames and that this was all meant to be. So so imagine after a month after she passes over, um, a friend of mine calls me up and says, Hey, man, can you help my sister-in-law, Amanda? She's moving from Montana to the San Francisco Bay Area. She has stage four breast cancer. She's 38 years old, the same age as when Margo passed, except she has three kids, no husband. She's a minority. She doesn't have good insurance, and she has no additional resources. I say, sure. So I take her to uh, Margo's oncologist, and he orders some tests. So I go, okay, I got nothing to do because I've been do- doing nothing but taking care of my wife for the last year, so I'll go with you. And so we go to about four or five different surgeries and tests and so on and so forth. And what I noticed immediately is that because she's a minority or because she doesn't have a husband or because she doesn't have a good job, I have no idea, but they're, she's treated much differently than what we were treated as. They either talk down to her or over her head. And, and I know what, I know the truth, right? So I did, but I just keep my mouth shut. I'm, a, I'm a, just an observer. And then we go back to Margo's oncologist and he says, Amanda, the best protocol to extend the quality of your life are these three chemotherapy simultaneously. Unfortunately, your insurance will only pay for one, so that's all I can give you. I have to tell you, for the first time in my life, I was blown away. I, I never realized that whether you live or die or get good treatment depends on whether you have money or not. And so I just immediately, instinctively gave this guy my credit card, and I said, you give her whatever it is she needs. Unbeknownst to me, that was the seed that became the Love for Margot Foundation. And for the next four years, I would give financial grants to women below the poverty line that were battling cancer. Why? Because they don't have money to begin with. Now they're sick and they can't work. Their expenses have gone up and there is no safety net for these poor women. So I did this for four years. I probably served over 100. And the typical grant was $5,000, a 1000 a 1000 per month. And I, I probably served 150 to 200 women. And I fell in love with these women. These women inspired me. They gave me so much courage. Um, they were just so amazing. But they didn't have a freaking prayer. Okay. I really, you know, in a perfect world, we would support them for four or five months. They'd go through the treatment. They're, they're dismissed from treatment. They go back to work. I think that worked a handful of times. A lot of times it was sicker, sicker, and die. And so I go, okay, well, this is not a good program. This is not sustainable. So I go, how can I help these poor women? Well, I know that their immune system is being destroyed, so perhaps I can help them strengthen their immune system. So now I'm buying water purifiers, juicy machines, vegetables, and they think I'm their doctor and I'm a car salesman. So I go, okay, this isn't going to work. So now... I go, what do I do now? So I've moved to Medellin, Colombia, and I'm building a healing retreat center where we will charge people to come here and learn to heal themselves. And the first week is all detox. The second week is all spiritual energy, sacred plant medicine type of work. So we work on the the mind and the emotions after we've cleaned the body. But most importantly, we want them to realize that everything they need to heal is within So we do a lot around meditation, a lot about rewiring the neural pathways, clearing clearing away emotional wounds because almost every illness is linked to some emotional wound. So this is our process now. And then we give a scholarship for, for, we do personally, uh, for a woman to fly to Columbia and and go through this experience themselves and learn how to heal themselves. And if people donate to our uh, foundation, then we can bring more women. So that's, that's my mission and purpose right now. This is a fantastic, um, an emotional story. Yeah. I think it moves many, many people. Um, the intention behind it, the story behind it, the fact that you didn't just let this tragedy um, tear you apart. On the contrary, mm-hmm. you put all your energy and all your intentions into giving, you know, women back their lives, yeah. their peace. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's behind that intention deeply, Mike. 
Let me add one thing. It did tear me apart. Okay. <laughs> it took, you know, you know, I'm sure you've worked with people with grief and, and, and my heart goes out to people with grief because mine was so severe, you know, but it was so severe. What's interesting. I was so devastated for the first time in my life. I had no resistance. So God was able to come in and, you know, this is an analogy, of course, but God was able to come in and flay open my heart, take out all the arrogance, all the self-centeredness, all the BS and replace it with love. So the, it took a long time to feel that, fill that big empty spot in my heart, you know, and for some people that don't do it properly, they become bitter. Uh, most people become better if they'll go through that experience soberly and experience and and feel the sadness and work their way through the sadness and work their way through the grief and the anger and the regret and the guilt and all that stuff, then eventually your life will never be the same. You will never be the same, but you can become much better, much richer, much deeper. So that was the other thing. Absolutely. And this is what I wanted to validate. And this is what I meant by that. I meant the fact that, you know, you managed to to do some some good on the on on the back of the tragedy that has happened to you and Margot, and you just didn't leave it um, yeah. like that separately individually. You actually made something grow out of this. You you created the foundation and you you designed an intention that uh, most probably was to support women uh, and probably to some extent. I don't know if that's the case, but probably to to some extent to to feel like you're. You're, you're still with Margo and Margo is still with, with you and going on this journey, uh, together. Yes. Um, Absolutely. let's go back to, to intentions and thank you so much for sharing this. I am aware that this is very private. By private, I mean very, very, you know, dear, a dear experience, uh, for you. And I'm, and I'm privileged to, to listen to it because I know how challenging it is to go through a brief period and then, you know, to, to present this to the world. So thank you very much for, for doing that. Going back to intentions, can we record our personal intentions? And, oh. um, cause actually you did mention that at the beginning, isn't yeah. it? So how can so, recording our intentions can, can help us overcome, you know, grief, addiction, anything that's, you know, yeah. seems very heavy to overcome. Well, I'm so, I'm so glad you asked that because, you know, like I said, in 1982, we used a boom box and a tape recorder and a theta brainwave music. So to make it easier for people, when I published my book, The Creation Frequency in 2018, I created an app that people can access. It's called The Creation Frequency. And all they have to do is download it. The relaxation script is on my website, MikeMurphyUnfiltered.com. They can get it there, but it's also inside the app, so they can read it from there. And we, we've also recorded one in, in someone else's voice, but I really encourage people to record it in their own voice. And you you know the power of hypnosis and putting someone into self-hypnosis yeah. and getting rid of that critical, analytical mind and getting into the subconscious. So so the app exists, It's a, and then... Once you do that, it's a recording, it's a tape recorder. And so you write your intentions and you re record the relaxation script with your intentions and you just play it every morning, every night. So that's available. Now, when it comes to, so every addiction starts with a compulsive personality. And, and I know a lot about a compulsive personality. Okay. So, so that I can really identify. And then it leads to a bad habit, which I can totally identify with. And in some cases it, leads to some sort of addiction. Now, there's different types of addictions. There's a mental, emotional, physical. The most powerful right now, you know, the hardest physical ones are opiates, of course, and heroin. And then cigarettes are very powerful. And most of them are just kind of emotional. And, you know, very few people fully get addicted to alcohol. you got to really drink a lot to get addicted to alcohol. But let's talk about if you have a compulsive personality, or more importantly, a lot of people have bad habits, especially in today's world with the internet. There's all kinds of sexual promiscuity, pornography, there's shopping, gambling. I mean, there's everybody's, I mean, everybody looks at their phone every 10 seconds when they're standing in line. So there's so many compulsive things. So I would do this. I would write a powerful intention that went something like this. I love it that I no longer have a compulsive mind. I love how I'm able to, through my breath, calm myself down, lower my brain waves, and find that complete wholeness where, where my heart and my head is coherent. And I feel so amazing, and I am so grateful that I have discovered this tool. And now I live my life conscious, 
where I'm aware in every decision I make is conscious and aware and it serves me to become the best version of myself. So I would write something like that that resonates with that individual. We all got to write our own thing. We all have our own love language, but write a powerful intention as if it already exists. I don't care. I don't care if you're drinking every night, you know, write a thing. You know, I love the fact that I'm sober. I love waking up fresh every morning, even if you drink, because you eventually you're going to give one or the other up. You're going to quit listening to these recordings or you're going to quit drinking. Right. But really it's reprogramming that subconscious mind, reprogramming the 50 trillion cells that crave stuff and send signals to the mind. It's actually maybe even reprogramming the bacteria and the virus and the parasites that are telling the the mind what they want rather than what we need. And so, and it's also going into the field of infinite possibilities where the right people, the right support will start to show up. It, you know, I want to say it's magical, but it's really not, you know, and, and the, the, the way the world is working today, you have people like Dr. Joe Dispenza doing this great work and proving all the, what blows my mind, he's proving scientifically Everything that this guy in 1982 taught me. Now, I've studied the guy since then, and I learned that he was studying Silva mind control, which is all about, you know, reprogramming the subconscious mind. So everything has made sense to me now, but back then, nothing made sense to me. But for your listeners out there, believe me, you can make your life so much better for a lousy 10 minutes a day. Once you do the initial work, you know, an hour or so, and really get this dialed in, then just listen five, 10 minutes every day. I promise you, your life will, ch- it must change. It's, it's scientific. Where can we find uh, the app, Mike? So just go to the app store, the Google Play, and just search the creation frequency. Mm-hmm. And the app is there. And, there, and I've also have a lot of videos that are free on my YouTube channel, Mike Murphy Unfiltered. And also on the creation, we have, cre- I would go to Mike Murphy Unfiltered, but there's a link there to go to the creation frequency. So there, I have a lot of this material for free. We do sell an online course. It's not very expensive. And for your listeners, I have a, a online course of right around about setting these intentions and I'll give it to them for free. If they want to just go to Mike Murphy unfiltered.com forward slash gift, uh, we will send them that um, online course about setting the intentions. Thank you, Mike. That's amazing. Thank you so much for that. Let's take a short minute of break and we'll come back with uh, Mike Murphy discussing the power of intention. UK health radio, the station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. And we're back with Mike Murphy. We are discussing the power of intention. And Mike, I do have a curiosity and I do need your help with helping me identify my personal intentions. I think I've always struggled a bit finding out, uh, having clarity towards what I want to achieve. So if the listeners are someone like me, a bit confused um, and a bit overwhelmed of the, the world of possibilities, isn't it? Because there's so much possibility out there. It makes it a bit challenging for some of us to choose what what we want to, to obtain in life and what's the, the intention. How do we identify the personal intentions that will take us on the right path or that resonate with us truly? Yeah. So number one, I suggest it's you pick a category. So whether it's your career or your relationship or having your own business or being a better parent, whatever it is, pick a category, health, whatever it is. Right. And say, okay, now have fun. Just just go just go crazy. Take a pen and a piece of paper. And let's say I want to manifest um, my own business. Okay. well, what kind of business? What what really turns me on? What feeds my soul? What makes me want to stay up late at night and get up early in the morning? Okay. The first thing that pops into my mind is I love golf. Okay. So I'll write golf. Now I'm 66 years old. So guess what? I'm not going to play on the PGA tour. Whatever, whatever, what else turns me on? Well, I love helping people. Okay. So I write that down. I love, um, I love cooking. So I write that down. Okay, so I'll write down all these things, all these possibilities, like you just said. I'll write down anything that pops into my mind. Okay, now I'll look at them. Now, you have to be practical. For example, I just mentioned I'm 65 years old. Maybe I said 66, but that's not till May. But I'm 65 (laughs) years old. So let's say my intention is I want to play 
Um, so I'll use your sport since we're you're in the UK. I want to play goalie for Manchester, okay? Well, guess what? There's never been a 65-year-old goalie for Manchester, and so and I've never played soccer. So even though I have that desire, it's not practical, right? It's never going to pierce my conscious mind and get into my subconscious mind. But could I be an assistant coach? Maybe. Could I become friends, a friend of the goalie of Manchester and learn about it that way? You know, can I become a trainer? Whatever it is, find your passion, find your purpose, which is not easy. Okay, everybody knows that, you know, and and, and keep in mind, it also always evolving. You know, when I was a 10 year old, I had this purpose, this passion. When I was 20 purpose, passion, it evolves, right? When I'm younger and I'm raising my kids and building my career, well, that took enormous amount of energy. That took money so we could have freedom. So I needed to manifest all that. Now I'm 65 years old. I think Carnegie said you spend the first half of your life making money and you spend the second half giving it away. So I'm in that stage. So what am I trying to manifest? I'm trying to manifest a world-class transformational health retreat. I'm trying to manifest books that will serve and help people because books save my freaking life, right? And so I'm grateful for all those authors. I probably read 2,000 books on personal development, nutrition, family, all that kind of stuff, business. So I'm very grateful for all those authors, and I know how much work it took to write that. So that's why I want to give back. I'm at a point in life right now is I'm not going to be here much longer, right? So what kind of legacy am I going to leave? I, I live by three quotes, or I try to. And believe me, I'm as messed up as anybody listening to this, though. So I don't want to. I don't want to tell you guys, you know, I'm better than you because we all have our challenges and we all have our struggles and we all have our shadow side. And it's not going anywhere. We just got to learn to deal with it, right? But here are my three quotes that I love. One, I think it was Edison. I, I always forget, but. Evil exists because good men do nothing. I love that one. The other one comes from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was um, a minister in World War II in Nazi Germany. And he could have left and he stayed and he ended up being murdered. And he said, a righteous man lives for the next generation. Well, I have four kids and seven grandkids, so I have to do that. And the third one, and this is what inspired the love for Margot Foundation. And this comes from Martin Luther King. And he said, an insult to justice anywhere is an insult to justice everywhere. And there's a tons of injustice in the world today. Medical, financial, legal. I mean, the, the, you know, they talk about racism in America. It's not racism. It's economic injustice. And they've just chosen a particular race to decimate economically. But, but that's all it is. So we have to understand that we, humanity is in a fragile condition right now. And we all need to move from our head to our heart and say, okay, how can I serve? How can I, how can I help humanity? You know, there's 7 billion people in the world right now. If 3.5 billion of us would lift up someone less fortunate, boom, everything shifts. All the craziness dissipates and we, we, the consciousness arises. And now we can start to usher heaven back on the earth. At least that's my hope. What are some examples of positive inter, uh, personal um, intentions for addiction, for example? Addiction yeah, was, recovery, yeah? Yeah, so, well, first of all, you know, boy, <laughs> it's such a big topic, you know, and, and, and it's so easy to, it's a slippery slope, too, you know, people that hooked on heroin, well, they started with alcohol usually and then, and then marijuana, right? So once you're full blown on heroin, you need help. I mean, you work, this, we, listening to this podcast, we're not going to be able to help. You need really big help. If you're addicted to alcohol, you need really big help. But if you're in that early stage and everybody knows it, you know, everybody knows when they do things compulsively and they go, Oh my God, why did I do that? And more importantly, why did I do that again? And that's a terrible feeling. But the really, it's what I really believe is people, when they know they have a bad habit like every night you know i got to go drink a half a bottle of wine and what they don't realize you know the body the cells are craving that wine they're craving it mentally they're craving emotionally and they think it's relaxing them and they sleep lousy and they wake up feeling terrible and now they got to do it all over again so how do you go about that well you need to cr- you need you dr joe dispenza talks a lot about this and i love it if you want to create a new personal reality you need to change your personality What is your personality? It's what you think and talk about and act. That's your destiny, right? So you need to change something. Now, one big step that I encourage people to do is to get out of themselves. 
So how can I get out of myself? Well, go help someone less fortunate. So go down to the old people's home, find a guy that has no one visitors or a woman has no visitors and say, I'm going to spend an hour with you every week if you'll allow me. And we can read, we can play chess, we can play checkers or just talk. I don't care. Or go find a, a hospital where you can volunteer some, get out of yourself and realize, you know, and, that there's more to this. And this is, you know, you touched upon this and I mentioned, I listened to one of your podcasts the other day where a cardiologist was talking about this. The hardest journey that everyone must take. And unfortunately, most people take it during that last breath is only 18 inches long. It's moving from the mind into the heart. See, my mind, and I'm not talking about my brain. My brain is the hardware. My mind is the software. The mind can, the mind can be programmed. The mind can be lied to. The mind can be uh, brainwashed, right? So I want to get out of that mind, and that's where the false self, the ego lives. I want to get out of there, and I want to get in the heart. See, my mind can trick you. My mind can lie to you. My mind can cheat you. My heart can't do any of that. My heart is pure. My heart is eternal, timeless consciousness. It's my soul. It's my essence. It's my energy. So when I live here, now I can use this supercomputer of my mind to manifest the life of my dreams. But most of us, because the heart gets hurt so much, we contract, we contract, we contract, especially in today's world with all this social bullying, all this nonsense. Man, it's too painful to live in the heart, although no one ever died of emotional pain. So so we got to tough it up and say, okay, I'm I'm going to live here and I'm going to heal this beautiful heart and I'm going to open. I'm not talking about the physical heart. I'm talking about the spiritual heart. And once we can open and we feel that love and we feel that connection, now we can access this supercomputer of the subconscious mind and create what we want. But when we live in this mind, I call it the insane asylum and the, the committee of psychopaths. I mean, it can take me in a million different directions that don't serve me. Every time I have a bad thought, then my the brain, the, the hardware, creates chemicals that support that bad thought and then feed the body. Now I feel bad. Okay. Think bad, feel bad. Now, when I think good, that, that hardware, the super brain makes great chemicals like, you know, dopamine and things like that. And now I feel good. So there's, there's science and art to all of this. And we're not just physical. We're not just mental. We're not just emotional. We're not just spiritual. We need to integrate all four of those. And then we can hit on all eight cylinders and then we can create a beautiful life. Mike, this is so true. I was reading somewhere that 85% of our thoughts are repetitive. And if they are negative, (laughs) then you you end up spending your whole day and then your whole week and then your whole month and then probably the whole year and the whole life uh, thinking the same, the same, the same destructive thoughts. And also, when you're thinking those thoughts, you're making the same chemicals, so now you're feeling the same. So guess what? If you think the same and feel the same every day, it's Groundhog Day, right? And you cannot create a better future. So we got to change something. So what's the easiest thing to change is our thoughts, and then that will change our chemicals, and that will change our behavior. And all of a sudden, our personal reality starts to shift. It, it, it's, it's, it's just it's scientifically proven, but we got to do a little bit of work. we got to get off that couch and get to work. It is challenging, isn't it? It is challenging because you you might say that you just said, actually, the simplest thing to do is to change your thoughts. But is it really, Mike? I'm I'm contradicting you a bit because, you know, if it would be that easy. It, it, it is it is when you're conscious all the time. See, we're only mm-hmm. conscious five percent of the time. If we're conscious a hundred percent of the time, then 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 I can guard my mind. Okay, I can say, oh, this is an interesting thought. It doesn't serve me. See you later. Okay. Well, we what normally what we do? Here's a thought. Then we chase it to another thought. Then we chase it to another thought. And then pretty soon we're so far down the road we don't even know where we are. And that's the power of meditation. See, when we're meditating, we're 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 turning off that analytical mind a great deal, that crit- critical mind, right? And we're, we're pulling the energy out of the body and we're lighting up that mind, you know, and if we can get to where we have a kundalini experience and open that pineal gland, now we're directly created the source. And now we have so much energy in our body that it becomes easier. But it, listen, this is all takes work. It's all a practice. Okay. You, you know, I'm a golfer, right? You're never going to master golf. I'm a meditator. You're never going to master meditation. So it's a practice. Okay. And so, but you got to do it. And if you do it and you, you don't have to get carried away, just slow and surely every day and use our creation frequency app. I promise it will help you. And, and everybody can do this, but you got to want to and you got to care enough about yourself. That's my biggest challenge, getting people to care about themselves. 
And I really want us to, to end up today's podcast with this element of care, of compassion. So let's take a couple of minutes of commercial breaks and then we'll be back uh, with Mike Murphy discovery, uh, discussing the power of intention and more specifically now close to the end, why is it important to be patient and compassionate towards oneself? UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. And we're back with Mike. We're discussing the power of intentions. And Mike was explaining to us why is it important to use personal intentions and how we can, you know, introduce ourselves into the world of intention and persevere with this, um, with this thought. So, Mike, why is it important uh, or how important is, is patience and compassion towards oneself during the journey to recovery? And in general, during this process, because as you said multiple times on today's conversation, it's not an easy ride, is it? No, ma'am. So let me speak to compassion first because I'm a lot further down that road than I am the patience road. <laughs> <laughs> good, good self-awareness, Mike. <laughs> Hey, I live in Columbia, South America, right? And early on, after I'd gone to 16 notaries to, to, to do one document, I go, oh, this is their country. I better learn to be patient. So, so, but compassion, you know, gosh darn, you know, I, wouldn't it be interesting to spend an hour in everybody's mind and just listen to how we berate ourselves, how we criticize ourselves, how we judge ourselves, how we beat ourselves up. And the whole time, it's so self-defeating, you know, and it's releasing all these negative chemicals. Now we feel terrible about ourselves and, and that we can control. We have to realize who we truly are. See, I'm not these 50 trillion cells creating this body that houses this soul. Okay. I'm not these thoughts. I don't even know where they come from and I don't even know where they go. Okay. So what I do know is I'm not my body. I'm not my thoughts. So who am I? I'm energy. I'm, I'm consciousness. Okay. And so how can I beat up consciousness? Okay. So, and so, and so and, and everything else is just a story. So when I drop the story and I move from the head to the heart, okay, at least there I'm compassionate. I promise you that. Okay. Now, the problem is when I move from the heart back to the head because I'm trying to create something beautiful and then and the and the physical world isn't cooperating me, they're throwing me curveballs, I gotta stay present, calm, or otherwise I become impatient, then I become perhaps angry or frustrated, and that does not serve me and it doesn't fix the problem. So so we have to love ourselves enough to be compassionate to ourselves, and then probably we all need to work on patience. Mike, thank you so much for your time today. It has been really insightful. I'm, I'm going through, you know, the questions, the list of, of questions that I was planning to ask you, <laughs> and we didn't manage to cover even half of it. But I guess this is a good sign, isn't it? Because, you know, at the end of the day, what's important is to speak about your work, your intention with your work, and, and to send a message of hope to anyone who's who's struggling, not just uh, people who are on, on the path to recovery but we also touched on grief and again thank you so much for sharing your experience we also touched on divorce and some yeah. other life experiences that you know most of the times they are traumatic and they yeah. do require us to to focus differently so so thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today thank you for having me Mike, I really want our listeners to get in touch with you listen to your um, videos you know physically reach out to you or send you an email or, or contact you over the phone. So where can we find out more information about your work? Okay, great. My personal website is MikeMurphyUnfiltered.com and you can contact me from there. Uh, we also have our transformational health retreat here in Medellin, Columbia called MountainsofHope.com. And we've also just started a new podcast about six weeks in called The Power of Your Voice and that you can... Uh, Sign up for that at Mike Murphy Unfiltered. And then we also have our nonprofit foundation, which is Love from Margo, M A R G O T, T on the end, dot O R G. Mike, best of luck with all of your projects. And I really hope you know you, you will get to touch people's hearts, as many people as possible. Thank you so much, Andre.